please find your seats. Um, so next we have, uh, we have the honor of having Michael Graziano here from Princeton. Um, Michael uh, actually did much of his education in Princeton, starting with a, a bachelor's in psychology. Uh, and then he did his PhD at MIT and uh, at Princeton University, uh, uh, as well as his postdoctor work. Um, and uh, he's contributed to really many, he's contributed, I think, very significantly to several uh, fields in neuroscience. Uh, originally in his studies with Charlie Gross on pretty personal space, um, later his work in his own lab on, on the organization of, of uh, the frontal cortex in terms of action maps, um, and now more recently studying the, the uh, mechanisms of attention and consciousness in the brain, which is what, what he'll talk about. Um, and I, I think it's also worth noting that he also um, composes symphonies, writes children's books, and is a pretty good ventriloquist, um, although I don't think he brought his, uh, no, no, the dummy is not here. Okay, but um, but I think so. In, instead of doing all of those things, uh, his talk is going to be uh, more, more about consciousness, and and you've already seen a little bit about it in the, from Aaron Sugar's presentation. And the title of his talk is a conceptual framework for consciousness. So please join me in welcome. Hello, everybody. I. Uh... I am a little sorry that I didn't bring uh, Kevin with me. Kevin's the the puppet. I can talk, but I don't think it does the same thing. So thank you all, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to talk to you about the attention schema theory, or um, AST. It's a, a theory of consciousness. In philosophy and science, consciousness has come to mean a subjective experience of, of, of anything, of any specific event, whether external, like a, a sensory event, or internal, like a thought, or an emotion. And uh, Aaron talked a little bit about that a modern definition of what consciousness is. Clearly not all events processed by the brain have conscious experience associated with them. Actually only a minority do. And an active field of study is trying to understand the mechanisms and the adaptive value, if any, of conscious experience. When I claim that the attention schema theory explains consciousness, that always sounds overblown, overly ambitious. Uh, how, how, how can a theory explain the magic of, of consciousness? If you could go back in time to the ancient uh, Athenians, and if you said, hey, I have a theory of lightning, they, they might have said, oh, come on, no, you don't. Lightning is a, a, a magic force of anger from Zeus. There's no explaining that. And, and you might have said, well, actually, lightning is a streaming plasma of electrons. It has nothing to do with magic or the supernatural. And with the right equipment, we can even create artificial lightning. I, I, I'm not sure the ancient Greeks would have believed you, but that's what the attention schema theory is. It's a mechanistic, demagic, demystified theory of many things. One part of the theory explains why people believe they have a consciousness magic inside of them. Another part of the theory explains why that particular self model has some really important cognitive functions. And the theory is buildable. I think the, uh, the study of consciousness is, is more and more a matter of technology. It, it, traditionally, it was all about philosophy, the philosophy of mind. Then it became part of psychology. 
and neuroscience. But I think the study of consciousness has now moved into a different phase. It's becoming a, a part of artificial intelligence. People want to build human-like machines. They want to build AI that can interface effectively with people. But if you're an engineer, uh, uh, consciousness is a fraught topic. You don't want to waste your time chasing magic. If somebody says, oh, just uh, make it complicated enough. Just make it integrated enough. Just uh, give it enough feedback loops and poof, a magic feeling will come out of it. I mean, that's not super helpful to the engineer. Uh, and I think most existing theories of consciousness are essentially magical. There's always a point at which they say, and then the magic experience happens. And first of all, why? Uh, why, why would a magic experience come out of a global workspace or out of integrated information or out of a higher order thought? Uh, to, to, to name a few theories. And, and those theories may be very good uh, as far as they go. They have value, but they reach a point where the logic stops and you encounter the assertion and then the essence of experience emerges. It's like alchemy. You put in frog tongue and newt eye and then poof, magically gold is supposed to come out. It's called the explanatory gap. A second engineering concern about most consciousness theories, maybe even a more important concern, is once you have a magic essence of experience in your head, if that's even possible, then so what? What does it do? Does it just float there? How does the feel itself, the, um, the experience-ness is what I have started to call it. How, how does that physically impact your neural networks, changing the way neurons are firing to affect your behavior? In other words, if you create the magic uh, in a machine, what good is it? So to an engineer, all of this is very dubious. What's the point of trying to build consciousness when it's ill-defined is apparently produced by magic and has no specified practical benefit. I think that's why the attention schema theory has become so well liked by computer scientists and artificial intelligence experts. It's become popular in that domain. I, I, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard engineers and computational neural network experts tell me, hey, finally, a, a, a version of consciousness that we can actually build. It's going to take a lot of study and development, but ultimately it builds, it, it, it's buildable and it points to specific practical benefits. So for this talk, I'm going to explain the conceptual framework to you, at least the main parts. My goal is not to give you a lot of scientific detail. I've tried that in other talks and it just causes confusion. You can look up my data papers online or you can ask me afterward. We have a ton of psychology and neuroscience data. I think it's more important to get across the overarching ideas. And if I can do that today, I will be very happy. The theory is at its heart, very simple. It says that the brain constructs an attention schema. Okay, what's that? I'll start with an analogy a very close analogy, another schema constructed by the brain, the body schema, and the essential insights will transfer directly to the attention schema. Your physical body is represented in the brain by a bundle of information. The body schema represents the shape of the body. It keeps track of posture and movement, and it makes predictions. It's probably constructed in a network of cortical areas, including the parietal lobe and the motor and premotor cortex. It's necessary for the good control of movement. You need to monitor and predict what your body 
body is doing to effectively control the body. And that's a general principle of control engineering. Any control system needs a model of the thing it controls. The same brain networks are also involved in looking at someone else and interpreting the other person's stance and movements. Modeling someone else's body. In that sense, a, a body schema plays a significant role in social interaction. Uh, it, 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 it's an often overlooked but important part of social cognition. And there's a third major consequence of having a body schema because higher cognition and language has some access to it. The body schema gives us explicit reportable knowledge about our own bodies. When you close your eyes, uh, you, you can no longer see your arm, but you still know how it's positioned, how it can move. You have an intuitive understanding of your arm. Even if you have an amputation, there's no arm at all. Um, you, you, you may still have a phantom. Actually, most people with an amputation have a phantom for at least a short period of time. Uh, and that is the body schema continuing to represent the missing arm and the information reaches higher cognition and verbal report. About 12 years ago, in the middle of studying the body schema, I was thinking about attention. In particular, selective attention, the way the brain focuses on and deeply processes a small number of items at a time. Uh, classically, people study visual attention, but you can selectively attend to a sound, to a touch, to a sentence, or even to a thought or to a memory, to internal events. Attention is a lot like an arm. I mean, it moves around from one set of items to another in a complex way, and the brain controls it strategically. It is not just pulled to the next shiny bright thing. You have the capacity to make it move somewhere. Oh, you can, you can move it away from the bright shiny thing towards something boring looking if you have a top-down command that says that's the thing I should be attending to. So you can strategically control your own attention. And I proposed that in order to monitor and predict attention so that the brain can control it effectively, the brain must construct an attention schema. And the more I studied this attention schema, the more I realized it plays a central role in human cognition. So what is an attention schema? It's a bundle of information that describes attention. If you could stick wires in the brain and extract information from someone's attention schema, uh, it would tell you about the complex state that the person's attention is in. It would tell you this item is a glow with attention while that item has less attentional glow. And all these items at the edge have only a dim amount of attention on them. And predictively, it would tell you what state is likely to come next. Attention is going to fade here because this item's not interesting and it's likely to shift over there in a moment. And Finally, it would tell you about the predicted effects of attention on thought and behavior. It would tell you things like, aha, because the text in this book that I'm reading is intensely aglow with my attention, I'm likely to remember it tomorrow. And because that game of catch over there those people are playing, because that's only dimly in my attention, I predict that I'm not going to be able to dodge that ball very well if it flies in my direction. We know these things intuitively. That's an attention schema, a descriptive and predictive model of attention. I'll tell you about three specific consequences of having an attention schema, which parallel the case for the body schema. First, having an attention schema should be useful for controlling your own attention. Supposing you're reading a book, and an annoying bee is distracting you. You want to sustain attention on the book and reduce it on the bee, uh, but you still want a little attention on the bee in case it comes closer. 
This task is much easier if you have a system that constantly monitors your attention to make sure it stays within the desired range on each object. And that predicts when your attention is about to slip. It's, it's called control engineering. You need a model of the thing you're controlling. Second, building a model of someone else's attention should be useful for social cognition. It's a part of theory of mind or intuitively knowing what other people are feeling and thinking. If you know what someone else is paying attention to and you know the rules of how attention uh, moves and how it impacts behavior, then you gain a huge predictive advantage. You intuitively know what's in the focus of the other person's attentive mind and therefore, you know what's going to drive that person's behavior. And third, the attention schema might be the source of explicit beliefs and implicit intuitions about consciousness. So let me expand on that. The, the brain's models are never accurate. They're always approximate. In this account, your brain is constructing a schematic model of attention. It's approximate. That's why it's called the attention schema. The model leaves out all the scientific details of how attention is really a, a competition between neuronal signals occurring physically and this and that network in the brain. According to this model, according to its imperfect, detailed, poor version of attention, according to the attention schema, uh, you possess an internal essence divorced from any physical mechanism. It just floats inside of you. The essence vividly, mentally takes possession of things, different things at different times, and it confers on you the ability to understand and react to those things. That's a schematic model of attention. It's a description of, of attention and what its predicted consequences are minus all the little physical implementation details. And indeed, that's how people describe consciousness. People believe they have conscious experience. We're certain we have it. We claim to have it. And, and, and unless you don't believe in basic logic, then you have to accept that the belief, the certainty, these things are based on information in the brain. And in AST, in this proposal, that bundle of information computed automatically in a deep layer serves as the brain's schematic model of attention. The theory, therefore, <clears throat> pulls together three processes. First, the incredibly useful ability to control your own attention, without which you can't really function in the world. And second, an incredibly useful abil ability to model other people's attention and make predictions about their behavior. And third, the, the, the least important outcome, the theory explains why we're so certain that we have a, a magic essence of, of conscious experience inside us. So from the technological point of view, AST may help us build artificial intelligence that is more capable at strategically controlling its own attention and more capable at social interaction. And as a fun side effect, AST may lead to machines that think they have consciousness, machines that self-describe as having conscious experience in the same way that the giant human neural network up here thinks it has a conscious experience. Uh, the theory is very simple. It's very simple, very logical. Uh, nobody ever understands it the first 10 times they hear it. <laughs> so here's a, here's a different way, a different take on the same theory. Suppose you're looking at an apple. You're paying at least some attention to it. Your visual system constructs a model of the apple. The model is a, a bundle of information about the apple, including its color, its shape, its location, and so on. Attention on the apple means that the visual model is boosted. Its signal strength is boosted. 
allowing it to reach higher cognition and explicit verbal report. So now there's an information throughput that allows you to say, there's an apple, it's green and it's round. And, and this sounds like the, um, the global workspace theory of consciousness. Attention boosts the apple's representation. That representation enters the global workspace, meaning that it can influence other systems around the brain therefore higher cognition and ultimately language can gain access to it. That's the global workspace theory. But I think there's something missing from this account of consciousness, if I may say so. I think what's missing is the consciousness part. Uh, th this is what I would call a magical theory because it's very reasonable, it's very scientific until you get to the part where a conscious experience emerges with no explanation evidently by magic. Consider this, suppose you're looking at the apple and I ask you, what's going on? What are you doing right now? What's going on? And, and you can describe the visual features in front of you. The apple is green, the apple is round. That's you as machine with an information throughput. A camera on a computer can do that, but you can make a second kind of claim. You can also say that you have a subjective experience of the apple. So what's the information source for that second claim, that claim about subjective experience. Every claim has an information source. Let's not appeal to magic here. It doesn't just magically emerge. Every claim has an information source. And this is where the attention schema comes in. In addition to constructing a visual model of the apple, what if the brain also constructs a model of attention? And this model, of course, is not an exact detail by detail account of attention. It does not depict neurons and competitive interactions or any of the physical underpinnings of attention. The brain does not need to know that level of detail about itself. Instead, the model depicts attention as something without any physical underpinning, something that's just there, ethereal. a mental possession, an essence inside you that makes certain things vivid, that empowers you to know and to act. The model in effect tells you that you have a conscious experience and it does so because that's a useful, quick and dirty description of what attention is. The information from these two models is put together, the model of the apple, the model of attention, just like information about color, and shape needs to be put together. Maybe there are direct cross connections between the two models, or, or, or maybe the information is linked together at a, a later stage in the processing. But when that combined information reaches higher cognition, it provides a sufficient basis for the system to think and to report, there's an apple, it's green, it's round, and I have a subjective experience of it. So you need both types of information to make the claim. Let's go back to this summary slide. And let's talk philosophy for a moment, brief moment. Some people call this an illusionist theory as opposed to a realist theory. A realist theory says there is a real phenomenon of consciousness. A real phenomenon underlies the beliefs and claims that people make about having conscious experience. And science can try to explain how the phenomenon emerges. An illusionist theory says, no, there is no real phenomenon of consciousness. It's an illusion. We just think we have it and we claim we have it, but there's no underlying real thing. And to me, that framing is not useful. It's a, it's a distortion that polarizes people into camps because what is this theory? It's a realist theory. <clears throat> it posits a real phenomenon, attention, that underlies the beliefs and claims that people make about having consciousness. But on the other hand, the thing we say we have and believe we have, the magic essence, of conscious experience that in, in, it envelops some of our perceptions and thoughts, that thing 
well, it sounds different from the actual physical phenomenon of attention. The information has become simplified and distorted along this pathway. So it's kind of an illusion. Look, my body schema tells me that I have an arm. That's not an illusion because I do actually have an arm. But my body schema gives me a simplified, imperfect representation of my arm. That model does not tell me about the little uh, mechanical internal details of my arm. And sometimes it gets it wrong. Heck, sometimes the body schema says my arm is here, but it's actually here. So in that sense, maybe it is a little bit of an illusion. The brain builds models. The models are never perfect. Therefore, any particular model can be both realist and a little illusionist at the same time. That's not a profound mystery. That's literally every model that the brain constructs. You can have a philosophical meltdown over that. But I just don't think that concern is very interesting to me. Consciousness is understandable in a pragmatic engineering sense without worrying too much about the philosophical labels. So is AST correct? Does the brain actually construct a model of attention, an attention schema, and use it for these purposes? Evidence for AST, uh, and there is considerable evidence so far, at least falls into three categories. The neuroscience data on cortical networks, the behavioral data on the relationship between attention and consciousness, and the behavioral data on the models that people construct of other people's attention. And here I'll give only a brief summary uh, of, of this evidence, because again, I, I want to get across the underlying concepts, uh, not the experimental details. You can read about those on your own. So let's start with cortical networks. In principle, AST could be realized on any computational hardware. I think that's important to point out. It's not necessarily tied to any specific brain area, uh, yet we can still ask whether the, the human brain contains structures whose activity patterns are consistent with building and using an attention schema. A structure like that should combine the following properties. It should be involved in building predictive models of your own attention, in controlling your own attention, in attributing mind states to other people, and it should be involved in reports your reports of your own conscious experience. That sounds like a tall order, but it turns out the temporoparietal junction or TPJ may satisfy these conditions, probably other areas as well. This one is more heavily studied. The TPJ is active in association with attention. Many of the results from the TPJ are consistent with predictive modeling of attention in predicting where your attention is likely to go next. And the classical findings uh, from Corbetta's group and many others since then, uh, including ourselves, have seen the same thing. The TPJ lights up when the prediction is wrong, when attention is pulled somewhere not predicted. So there is something in there making predictions about attention, about where attention is likely to go next and comparing the prediction to reality. And then that area lights up when there's a gap or an error in the prediction. An overlapping sub area of the TPJ is also classically involved in theory of mind. It's the hot spot for theory of mind in the cortex, attributing a mind to other people. In our own work, it, it, it lights up nicely when people judge whether someone else is conscious of a nearby object. It also lights up when you report that you yourself are conscious of something. We, we've done uh, an experiment where in one condition you're aware of a visual stimulus and another one you're not, same stimulus, you're not aware of it anymore. And TPJ is uh, lit up when uh, in the aware condition versus the unaware, when you say, yes, I'm aware, I saw, I'm conscious of that. And finally, damage to the TPJ is associated with 
hemispatial neglect, um, a clinical syndrome, which the patient loses attentional control toward and also subjective consciousness of anything on the opposite side of space. It's, it's arguably the most devastating specific deficit of consciousness in the classical literature. And all of these properties are emphasized in the right TPJ, but to some extent can also be found on the left. These overlapping findings point toward the TPJ playing a role in constructing an attention schema, which is then involved in the control of attention in attributing mind states to others and in a person's claims about his or her own subjective consciousness. Now, the, the TPJ is just one node in a larger network. It is unlikely to operate alone. It probably has many functions beyond the ones noted here. But a fair amount of evidence points to the TPJ at least helping construct this model of attention. There's good evidence from the neuroscience side of a model of attention constructed in the brain being associated with these functions. Now let's talk about another area of research, the, the relationship between attention and consciousness. In AST, if you claim to be conscious of nothing, based on cognitive access to the attention schema, uh, and the attention scheme in turn is a representation of the state of your attention. This is AFC. Experimentally, this means that consciousness and attention should almost always go bare. What you attend to, you should normally be conscious of. What you don't attend to, you should normally not be conscious of. And this is experimentally true almost all the time. Some theorists, such as uh, Jesse Prince, even propose that consciousness is attention because the two co-vary so tightly. In AST, the two aren't exactly the same. Consciousness is essentially the picture the brain paints to represent attention. And that little bit of daylight between consciousness and attention is important. It, it, it comes about because the brain's models are never perfect, right? They make mistakes. For example, the arm model tracks the arm most of the time, but makes occasional mistakes. Uh, just so uh, we should expect the attention schema to make the occasional mistake. Maybe at one particular moment, you're attending to the apple, but the attention schema glitches and fails to represent that state of attention. In that case, you're attending to something without reportable consciousness of it. And that phenomenon is now well established in, in probably about 100 studies by now. Uh, some of which we've done. Attention and consciousness almost always match, but with dim or brief stimuli, it's possible to measurably draw a person's attention to an object while the person has no conscious perception of that object. Very strange, but true. And, and it makes sense in AST. And here's another very specific prediction and, and apologize, uh, apologies for a slightly complicated logic here. According to AST, if you're attending to an apple, but the attention schema has glitched, so you're not conscious of the apple. So this case, that should mean you also lose the ability to control that focus of attention on the apple. Attention got yanked to the apple in a bottom-up way but you should have no top-down control over it. In AST, attention is possible without consciousness, but a good endogenous internal control of attention should be impossible without consciousness. And many experiments, including some from my own lab, uh, show that exactly that pattern. And I'll summarize one particular elegant example, which is not from my lab, but from Sushima et al. from all the way back in 2006, when you're performing a task centered at location A, and it requires a lot of attention, it is advantageous to reduce it attention on a distractor at location B. And people are usually uh, good at that kind of nuanced control. However, when people are not conscious of the distractor, 
they lose control over their attention on it. And more of their attention is siphoned over to the distractor. So think about that. When you are conscious of a distractor, you pay less attention to it. You're able to pay less attention to it as you should. And when you're not conscious of the distractor, you lose control and pay uh, more attention to it. That's control theory in action. You need a functioning control model to control attention. And these kinds of com complexities are neatly explained by the theory and, and really not by any other theory that I know of. AST is at its heart about the specific relationship between attention and consciousness. Consciousness plays a crucial role in controlling attention. It, it, it comes, it all comes down to this realization that attention needs model-based control and think about the importance of controlling your own attention. This is not a trivial thing. It's very important. For example, if you wanna make a peanut butter sandwich, what's more important than that? Uh, you, you have to internally strategically move your attention around, focusing it on the cabinet where the peanut butter is, the drawer uh, where the knife is, the shelf where the bread is, then you have to pay attention to the chair as you sit down at the table. Then you alternately pay attention to the jar as you scoop out peanut butter and, and, and the bread as you spread it. You have to direct your attention strategically in a timed sequence, not to the next brightest shiny object in the room, but to where you on the basis of a task demand uh, decide in a top-down fashion you want your attention to go. You have to control your attention. And if you don't have a good model of attention, an attention schema to monitor and to predict what your attention is doing, then moving your attention around strategically uh, becomes very difficult. Just like for any control problem, a control system without an internal model is, is crippled. All of complex, flexible human behavior depends on it. it isn't just for making a sandwich it's for almost everything you do every day in your life that's the importance of an attention schema in the framework of this theory the attention schema is the control model that allows you to control your own attention which allows you to carry out complex and flexible behavior so in this theory consciousness is not just a minor add-on that we can ignore when we uh, think about how the brain works. It's it's really central to most complex behavior. Now let's talk about social cognition. What is the evidence for this part of the theory? It's well established that people construct, reconstruct the attention of others. And in that sense, we already know this part of the theory is correct. We build models of other people's attention. But most work on social attention focuses on one simplistic part, how you reconstruct the gaze direction of others. And, and, and the, the richness of the model of attention has only recently begun to be studied. For example, turns out you integrate gaze cues with facial expression uh, and context cues to reconstruct someone else's attention. You even reconstruct whether the other person's attention was endogenously drawn or exogenously drawn to an object. One of the, the weirdest and, and most interesting examples of a social model of attention comes from experiments in my own lab if you look at a face, if you think a face is attending to an object, it, it turns out that you build a subthreshold visual model of attention. Visual motion areas in your brain become active in a, a pattern consistent with a stream flowing from the face to the object of its attention. Measurable signal in the brain. Not only does it appear in, in brain scans, but it also creates a measurable motion after effect. And if you're asked to judge whether a tilted object is likely to fall over, it turns out your decision is unconsciously affected by the presence of a face staring at the object 
as though the attentive gaze of the face is streaming toward and gently pushing on the object. And even more telling, if I show you a face in an object and if I include in the image an actual faint subthreshold visual motion signal flowing from the face to the object, it's so faint you don't explicitly notice it, but it's there just enough to tickle your visual motion areas. It turns out you will perceive that face to be more attentive to the object. So it appears that we humans automatically represent attention, at least partly, as something flowing from the attentive person to the object of attention. It's like drawing arrows on the social world. Uh, I think the motion signal uh, probably helps people to swiftly and, and intuitively keep track of who is attending to what. And it happens under the surface. We're not uh, really aware of doing it. I think that the visual motion signal is, is kept to a low level, a sub-threshold level, because if it, if it got any stronger, it would interfere with real, uh, real vision. So I don't want to harp too much on the weird phenomenon of the eye beams, uh, because I think it's just one little part of how we model attention, but it's a cool little detail. And, and it may be that this cool little detail built into the social machinery has had some influence on the common cultural beliefs about mind and soul, including folk beliefs about consciousness as a subtle, invisible energy, like an essence that can shine out of us like an aura or a chi or a ghost or, or soul. So in the overarching theory, An attention schema is crucial for controlling one's own attention, without which you would be unable to do almost any complex sequence of actions. And an attention schema is crucial for attributing an attentive mind to other people, a basic component of social cognition. Without it, you would have very poor social competence. And an, an attention schema gives rise to common beliefs and mythologies surrounding consciousness that make people think of it as a hard problem or a mystical problem, a private intangible essence. So this is the attention schema theory. And this is why my work over the past 12 years have, has, has become so obsessed with this attention schema because I see it as a, a kind of linchpin to a lot of human cognition. From the point of view of artificial intelligence, Consciousness, I think, is now ripe for investigation. This framework gives us the mechanistic outlines of what consciousness is. We have an idea, at least roughly, of how to go about building it. And we have some insight into the value that it adds or, or, or why it would improve the performance of an artificial agent and, and make the agent better able to interface with people. And this is why I think the study of consciousness is, is no longer primarily about philosophy or psychology or neuroscience. From now on, I think consciousness is primarily about technology. And I'll end with a claim that I often make and that I think is true. The watershed moment in the history of our species that will change us forever, maybe for good, maybe for bad, I think for good, is the inevitable moment that we understand consciousness well enough to construct it artificially. Thank you all. Um, and so let's, let's have some questions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Michael, for the great talk. It was very clear, no need for 10 times, very, uh, very convincing. Um, well, I was primed, so um, I have a small comment. Um, you've used the word uh, predictive prediction several times, and you've used it in, in a way that's very common in the neuroscience community of thinking of, in, in your case, in the case of uh, the attention schema, predicting where attention will be next or something like this. And I think we have to be very careful when we use those words. 
So typically what people picture when you say those, those words is uh, we predict one state of attention as the, the thing that's going to happen. And in a deterministic world, that's fine. But of course, that's not how the world is. E even how our brain computes has you know randomness and it's driven by random stuff in the brain and outside. And so really what makes more sense is to think of uh, predicting the distribution of how things will be. In other words, are you going to be surprised by the state of attention next or not? And that's a different way mathematically to think about it. So it's the same problem you have with predictive coding, you know, theory that posits that, you know, there will be this one thing we're going to predict. And if it's, there's a mistake, then you can report it. But really that doesn't make sense because it could be this way. It could be that way. Maybe the Necker cube is this way or that way. And both are plausible. And you want to predict one thing in the middle. You want to say, you know, this is the distribution to expect. You can do that by learning energy functions that just report how unlikely something is compared to what you expected. So in other words, predicting, not predicting one unitary outcome, but saying there's this distribution of likelihood of-, well, of You don't, of you don't represent the distribution explicitly. What you have is a function that takes the thing that, that happens next and reports a number that says, oh yeah, this is, this is according to the, the sort of stuff I expected or not. It's, it's, it's not what I, the kind of thing I expected, but many things could have been, yes, it's fine. And of course, uh, the majority of things would be, no, this is unusual, unexpected. Yeah, very interesting. I, I definitely have to think more about that because there are other, other languages one can wrap around this. Um, yeah, sure, yes. Thank you. Hi, um, so I'd first like to apologize for not being extremely familiar with neuroscience in general. Like I'm, as an engineer who's excited about the computability of attention and consciousness. Um, so can you, can you help me understand, since in my mind, you know, I see the brain as a model and I see attention as a model of something and I see this attention schema as a model of this model. So are, so are we, should I look at this as like an intent, like an information theoretic bottleneck of the larger model of attention or like a, like a poor man's version or how, how should I interpret the difference between the two? Right. So. I mean, I can tell you from my neuroscience perspective, what, what I think of attention. Uh, attention is a data handling method by which some signals are enhanced at the expense of other signals. Mm -hmm. And the enhanced signals then have a whole series of um, impacts on other systems around the brain. And that state of enhancement uh, has a tendency to shift around in, in certain predictable ways. That's how I would describe attention. I would not describe attention as a model because it's not itself a set of information in the brain about something. Okay. It's a process of data enhancement. And so when I talk about the attention schema, that's more of, well, let's build some information about what this attention process is and how it's likely to move around and change. Okay. So that's how I would think of it. Um, but it's a very tricky, strange, loopy thing mm -hmm. at times. Because what happens if you're uh, paying attention to uh, your own attention? You're, mm -hmm. I mean, you, yeah. or you pay attention right. to a model. That's what attention does. Attention enhances the model of the apple. Attention enhances the model of your hand. What happens when attention enhances the model of attention? Mm. Yeah. You know, you get a lot of weird dynamics and strange loopy things going on. And, and I definitely acknowledge that. That's a, a, an interesting complexity. Mm -hmm. um, but I, from a neuroscience point of view, tend not to think of attention as a model. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, some related. Um, and they're basically um, asking about whether there's a missing part when using AST to explain consciousness. Where does the subjectivity or subjective experience yeah, uh, come from? Exactly. Where does the squirrel come from? Uh, <laughs> I, I love the squirrel example, which a friend of mine originally told me about a patient of his, and Aaron so beautifully described it. Yeah, you get to that guy who's convinced he has a squirrel in his head, and you say to him, well, your brain computed information that led you to the conclusion and the certainty that you have a squirrel. And the guy says, yeah, yada, yada, information, conclusion. But you haven't explained the squirrel. Where's the squirrel? Like your your theory fails because it didn't explain where the squirrel came from. And I think that's the answer here. Uh, that yeah, that's the answer. 
the, you, you believe you have subjectivity, and this is what this theory explains. You're certain this theory is wrong, and this theory explains why you're certain this theory is wrong. <laughs> Hi. Uh, is this on? Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Oh, it is? Okay. Shout. <laughs> I so can I can hear. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can hear myself now. I, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, serial versus parallel views of attention and how that fits in with, with your sort of schema. My sense is that, you know, attention is the taking possession of mind. I think if we look on fi fine enough time scales, there's pretty good evidence that it's, um, you know, serial, but then there are also parallel models like the priority map. And, and then it, it wasn't clear to, and consciousness, my subjective sense certainly is, is that that's kind of a serial thing that maybe has some kind of parallel pluripotency to it, but yeah, could you? Right, so I don't know if this will directly answer your question, but one of the issues that sometimes people find tricky about this theory is there's lots of details about attention. There's lots of kinds of attention and there's bottom up and there's top down and there's uh, attention at the lowest level that you can find evidence in a primary visual cortex and, and at higher levels that um, you have uh, it's different um, uh, sort of the, the, the kinds of things you pay attention to increase in complexity as you go up the hierarchy. Uh, you have uh, inhibition of return and you have uh, overt and covert to you have all these different kinds of labels and pieces and focused attention and distributed attention, um, parallel and uh, serial. And then there's this model that the brain builds, the attention schema, which is super simple and throws away most of that detail and just says there's a cloudy thing in my head that kind of in series gloms onto a set of objects. It has some parallel capacity, but not that much. And then it moves around from thing to so the model of attention is fuzzy. So wait, so the schema, the schema itself is serial in your mind, or so the, the schema is depicting attention in a very simple way, and so it throws out most of that complexity, and so the schema, the attention schema, both describes the state attention is in, meaning uh, you're mostly attending here and a little bit here right now in this moment in time. Now you're attending here in this moment in time. So in that sense, it's serial. But the model also includes information about um, predictability of what, uh, how, uh, how attention uh, tends to transition from state to state. I don't know if that helps. So, okay. So actually, I, I think this discussion shouldn't really spill into the panel uh, discussion that we're going to have, uh, with, in which we're going to include also Yashua and, and Aaron and, and Michael up on stage. And then many of the questions you have, if you knew it during some of the Zoom, uh, I think could probably be asked the whole panel after you get the answers to the questions. So let's um, let's thank Michael for excellent.